a milestone for humanity. That's the title on the TV monitors at the White House press conference. It's the summer of 2000, and the room is full of people, journalists, ambassadors, scientists. This isn't a typical presidential press conference. This is a celebration. Finally, President Bill Clinton arrives and steps up to the microphone. Good morning. He starts off thanking everyone for coming. There are a lot of high-profile guests present. Prime Minister Tony Blair is not here, but he is joining by video conference from the other side of the Atlantic. Welcome here. Then Clinton begins to speak about the reason they are all gathered here, the reason for that dramatic title on the TV monitors. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. The human genome, a complete record of the DNA inside us. Clinton, though, goes further. He calls it the The language language in which God created created life. life. We are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. With this profound new knowledge, humankind is on the verge of gaining immense new power to heal. Genome science will have a real impact on all our lives, and even more, on the lives of our children. The scientists and diplomats gathered from all over the world that day hoped that by translating that book, we'd finally be able to read the stories written in its pages. Decoding our genome and learning how our DNA works will help answer some of the most enduring questions in human history. Clinton does point out the dangers of this new technology, the ethical challenges humanity now faces. He suggests that challenge will require as much cooperation and hard work as the mapping of the genome itself. Still, he ends on an optimistic note. I suppose in closing, when we get this all worked out, we're all living to be 150. Young people will still fall in love. Old people will still fight about things that should have been resolved 50 years ago. (laughs) We will all on occasion do stupid things, and we will all see the unbelievable capacity of humanity to be noble. American Innovations is pleased to have ZipRecruiter as its presenting sponsor. ZipRecruiter strives to lead the way in innovative talent recruitment for businesses of all sizes. It's the smartest way to hire. Their powerful technology sends your job post to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. Then they learn from your feedback to better understand what kind of candidate you're looking for. We sat down with Ryan Eberhard, Senior VP and Head of Product at ZipRecruiter. Under Ryan, the product team is constantly improving their technology to connect job seekers with the right employers. Stay tuned at the end of this episode for an inside look into ZipRecruiter's culture of innovation. You'll be getting to know Ryan and ZipRecruiter even better over the next few episodes. And now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com AI. That's ZipRecruiter.com AI. One more time. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. From Wondery, this is American Innovations. I'm Stephen Johnson. In this series, we're going to look at some of the most important innovations of the last hundred years. From the personal computer to nuclear power, these innovations have totally transformed our world, sometimes for good and sometimes for bad. And we're going to hear about the people behind those innovations. I've always been fascinated by these innovators, scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and sometimes just ordinary people. And a question I always find myself asking is, what was it about that time or place that made the idea possible? That was a theme in my book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And one thing I've learned from some of these great innovators is that 
Even when they seem to be lone geniuses, no one comes up with an idea all by themselves. And they usually don't do it all in one eureka type moment. Just take Isaac Newton, the English scientist and mathematician, who among other things is credited with the discovery of gravity. You might know the story about how the idea hit him, literally while sitting under a tree. Now, that might just be a myth, but what is true is that Newton himself knew that none of his discoveries would have been possible without the work of others. He once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Throughout history, that's what innovators have done, stood on their shoulders to see just a little further or a little differently. That's certainly true in this six-part series, The Dynamo of DNA. This series is all about the stuff buried deep inside our cells that make us who we are. Figuring out that genetic code has changed the world and helped us explain age-old mysteries. In fact, DNA would prove to be such an important molecule that it would quickly jump the boundaries of biology and revolutionize other areas of society too, creating whole new fields of research and business. From healthcare to crime, DNA has completely transformed our world. In this episode, we're going to go back about 150 years, long before Bill Clinton announced the Human Genome Project in the White House, to meet two scientists who, in their own way, laid the groundwork for the discovery of DNA. It's a story that stars cloned sheep, a room of fruit flies, and salmon sperm. But before we get to the salmon sperm, it's the winter of 1860. And in a little greenhouse on the grounds of a monastery in Brno, a monk is bent over looking for green shoots in a row of pea plants. The St. Thomas Monastery is in what's now the Czech Republic, but was then part of the Austrian Empire. The monks here are known for being inquisitive types, always doing some experiment or another. And this young monk is no exception. His name is Gregor Mendel and he can often be found here in the greenhouse or in one of the outdoor courtyards. In one of the pots, he spots a tiny green shoot just beginning to push up through the soil, the first sign of life from the peas he planted only a couple of weeks earlier. It's still cold outside, but here in the warmth of the greenhouse, things grow a lot quicker. Mendel pushes his round spectacles up his nose, shuts the greenhouse, and heads over for prayers. Like many of the other monks, Mendel had joined the order precisely because it was the only way he could continue his studies. Gregor wasn't actually his original name. It's a name he was given when he became a monk. When he was a young child, a local priest had recognized something in young Johann Mendel. The priest went to Mendel's parents. Young Johann should go to school. But for Mendel's family, that was easier said than done. We can't afford to send him to school. But what about your daughter? You think my daughter should study? <laughs> no, that wasn't likely in those days. But have you saved a dowry for her? In the end, Mendel's family gave up most of their daughter's dowry, the money intended for her marriage, just so Johann could go to high school. Soon after joining the monastery, Mendel became seriously depressed. Maybe it was the work of tending to the sick and the surrounding communities, or maybe he was just having difficulty adjusting to life as a monk. Either way, his mood only lifted when he was sent away to the University of Vienna. He loved university, especially his statistics classes. While in Vienna, he spent his free time charting sunspots with a telescope and tracking tornadoes. In one of his classes, he learned to use a microscope and used it to look at pieces of plants laid out on glass slides, examining the green cells packed together like rows of boxes, each with a single black spot in the middle, the cell's nucleus. But he always seemed happiest outdoors, tending his bees and gardening. He returned to the monastery with renewed energy, determined to do his own research. At first, he has the idea that he will study the science of plant breeding, maybe with the goal of creating new hybrids for farmers. After all, his family are farmers themselves. And farmers have been coming up with new kinds of plants and animals for hundreds of years, always trying to get something that's bigger or stronger or tastier than old varieties. 
Mendel decides to try and figure out how characteristics from one generation are passed to the next. For instance, why do offspring resemble their parents? What causes that? And why are some traits more common than others? Mendel wasn't the first to ask these kinds of questions. In fact, they had preoccupied philosophers and scientists for thousands of years. 2,000 years earlier, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle had come up with his own theory. He decided that sperm must provide what he called the form of a new animal, the information about what shape the animal would take or how many arms or legs it might have. And the egg provided the matter, kind of like the clay that's used to shape the creature. Both males and females had a role, but the female role was to supply the raw material, while the male's contribution sculpted the offspring. Nowadays, we know that's wrong. Males and females contribute equally to their offspring's traits. But Aristotle's theory is important because he was one of the first to suggest that there might be a biological explanation for what everyone knew. Living things that are related look alike. But he was still in a minority of people who thought like this. Mystical forces and superstitions were very much the order of the day, and it would remain that way for hundreds of years. One of the more unscientific theories was known as maternal impressions. This was the belief that children were shaped by their mother's experiences while pregnant. If something frightened a pregnant woman or made any kind of strong impression on her, then it would imprint itself on the child. This inspired a whole bunch of different folk stories. A woman who ate too many strawberries while pregnant gave birth to a child who was completely covered with splotchy red birthmarks. A woman who was apparently startled by sea monsters gave birth to a son whose skin resembled scales and who smelled like fish. The church actually played a role in spreading some of these stories. Bishops would tell the story of the sinful wife of an actor who seduced her husband backstage at a theater performance. The story goes that he was playing the part of Satan and was dressed in full costume at the time. The result? A child born with hooves and horns. In Gregor Mendel's day, another popular belief about heredity was called blending theory. Basically, this was the idea that a child's characteristics, hair color, height, skin color, were literally a blend of its parents' characteristics. It made a lot of sense at the time. You can imagine each parent's set of characteristics like a paint color being mixed together on a palette. But there were some problems with this theory. Some things just couldn't be explained by blending. A characteristic that seemed to have completely disappeared in one generation would pop up a few generations later. Children with red hair were sometimes born to parents with black or brown hair. Tall parents sometimes had short children, and so on. Mendel set out to study how these characteristics were passed down through generations. He couldn't know it when he started, but his work would eventually lead to a whole new branch of science, genetics. Mendel goes to his superior at the monastery. Abbot Cyril Knapp is fond of Mendel, but more than that, he's a true believer in the value of science. So when Mendel stops by his study one day with a research proposal, he listens. I want to better understand how traits are passed down from parent to child. Interesting. How do you intend to do that? By studying mice. I'd like to breed the mice with one another until I have enough to see patterns in them. I see. And how many mice would you need? I'd hope for hundreds, maybe even thousands. Maybe the monks decide they don't want to risk thousands of mice getting loose in the monastery, or maybe the idea of a monk closely watching the breeding habits of rodents just doesn't seem right. Either way, it's a no-go on the mice experiment. So Mendel, the son of a farmer, shifts his focus to plants, in particular, pea plants. Now, this may be the part you remember from your high school biology class. But Gregor Mendel studied peas for a few different reasons. First, bees can't pollinate pea plants very easily, so he had more control over which plants mate with which. Second, peas grow quickly, especially in the monastery's greenhouses, which meant he could observe several generations of peas in the span of a single year. And third, pea plants have several distinct, easy-to-observe traits. These traits are easy to categorize. They're usually one thing or another. 
The stalks are either tall or short, never medium. Flowers are either white or purple. Peas are either wrinkled or smooth, yellow or green. There is no in-between. It just made everything a lot simpler, a lot tidier. Mendel decides to study seven traits in peas, and he begins cross-pollinating plants with opposite traits just to see what happens. He fills notebook after notebook with observations about his findings. The monk in the greenhouse has become obsessed with figuring out the answer to how traits are inherited. Little does he know that just 350 miles away, another scientist is holding the answer in his hands. It's January, 1868. It's early morning, and in a hospital in Tübingen in Germany, a bearded man wearing a thick coat makes his way quickly along one of the corridors. He's come to the hospital laundry room. Inside, it's damp and warm. He looks around impatiently. Where is it? Where is it? Just then, the door opens and in walks a nurse carrying a basket. Herr Misha, you, you startled me. I came to pick up the bandages myself this morning, but the basket wasn't here. Let, let me see those. To the nurse's obvious shock, he pulls the basket out of her hands and begins picking through the soiled bandages. It's a veterans hospital, so many of the soldiers have old wounds that leak pus and blood, and they need clean cloth bandages daily. Sometimes they can be washed and reused, but other times they're too filthy and are thrown onto a trash heap out back. The nurse doesn't understand what he's looking for. What was wrong with the last set? What did you say? What was the problem with the last bandages we sent? Not fresh enough. The man has collected a bundle of bandages and is about to leave. Is it true you're studying pus? No, not strictly true. It's white blood cells I'm interested in. What are you going to do with the blood cells? He's halfway out the door now, but he turns. I'm going to figure out what's inside them. And like that, he's gone. The scientist's name is Frederick Miescher, and those bandages are going to help him discover the chemical building block of life. If Gregor Mendel had entered the clergy in part to continue doing scientific research, then Friedrich Miescher was the mirror image. Miescher had wanted to become a priest, but his father pushed him to study medicine instead. In 1868, at age 24, Miescher starts working in Tübingen, in southwest Germany, in a new natural science institute located inside of an old castle. Miescher's lab is in the basement, in what had been the castle kitchen. The lab is roomy with vaulted ceilings, but with tiny windows that don't let in much light. Miescher once said the gloom reminded him of a medieval alchemist's lair. In this lair, he works long hours at a large wooden bench surrounded by glassware. He's disheveled, and his equipment is usually dirty. But he works hard. In fact, he works a little too hard for his own good sometimes. A colleague once described him as driven by a demon, and another commented that the impression he gave was of a person completely taken up by his inner mental activity without contact with the outer world. A few years later, Miescher would almost miss his own wedding because he started a new experiment that morning and got distracted. Those pus-covered bandages from the hospital are for one of Miescher's first projects. He's interested in white blood cells, and he needs the bandages because pus contains white blood cells. He's especially interested in a structure inside the cells called the nucleus, that dot that Mendel had seen through his microscope. The key are the blood cells on those dirty bandages. Each morning, Miescher washes the bandages in a sodium solution to get the white blood cells off them. Then he goes about isolating the nucleus from the rest of the cell, like it's a peach and the nucleus is the stone at the center. First, he uses warm alcohol to dissolve the fats and lipids, including the cell's outer layer. Then he uses extract from a pig's stomach to digest most other parts of the cell. In the end, he's left with a glob of white mucus. In fact, lots of small nuclei stuck together. Now he has his nucleuses, but he still doesn't know what they're made of, so he sets about putting the glob through a series of tests. 
First, he drops it in chemicals that would break it down and dissolve it if it were a protein. But the glob of white mucus is unfazed. Then he tries boiling it in salt water. Nothing happens. Then he tries boiling it in vinegar, a stronger solution. Still nothing. Then he really goes for it and drops the glob into a solution of boiling hydrochloric acid. Nope. The white glob remains stubbornly intact. In a last-ditch effort, Miescher sets it on fire. This actually works, because he can analyze the gas and ash to see what was in the goo. For the most part, the results don't surprise him. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, all common elements and proteins, which is what he assumes the goo is. But then one element stops him in his tracks. Phosphorus. No known protein contains phosphorus. It just doesn't make sense. Miescher starts to get excited. He gets more dirty bandages, does more experiments, and pretty soon he starts to believe he's discovered a whole new type of substance inside cells. Because it was the substance he'd extracted from inside the nucleus, he names it nucleon. Miescher doesn't realize it, but he's just discovered the basic building block of life. What he called nucleon is what scientists today call deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Audiobooks are a great sidekick for summer activities like hiking, or sunbathing on the beach, running, road tripping, or lying in the air conditioning to escape the heat. Listening is a better way to binge content you love while doing the things you love. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks available, so whatever you choose to do, you can do it with audiobooks. Fill your summer with more stories like The Violinist's Thumb by Sam Keen. We've talked a lot about DNA today, and Sam's book goes into even more depth. He shows you how DNA can explain everything from crazy cat ladies to why people have no fingerprints, and how the best violinists on the planet owe a lot to inheriting exceptionally flexible thumbs. Sam is also the author of this arc of American Innovations. So if you're enjoying this episode, I know you'll love this book. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in their store, regardless of price. And unused credits roll over to the next month. Since I know you'll love this book with Audible, you can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. Start a 30-day free trial, and your first audiobook is free. Go to audible.com slash AI, or text AI to 500 slash 500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash AI, or text innovations to 500 dash 500. Whatever you do this summer, do it with Audible. While Miescher is setting fire to pus in a castle basement, several hundred miles away, Gregor Mendel is getting ready to reveal the results of his own research. It's 1863. It's been eight years, and he's crossed thousands and thousands of pea plants. Out in his greenhouse, a row of pea plants are just starting to flower. Mendel is busy scribbling in his notebook, so absorbed in his work that he doesn't hear the sound of his name being called until another monk sticks his head around the door of the greenhouse. Brother Mendel! What? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Come in. The younger monk enters and watches as Mendel works his way down the line of plants. What's the trick? The trick? How, how do you make them all tall like that? Mendel laughs. laughs. There's no trick. It's in the breeding. I bred tall plants like these together until I was only getting tall plants. Then I tried breeding them with short plants like those ones over there. But I found it still produces only tall plants in the second generation. And have you noticed anything else about the peas? They're all yellow. I noticed it in the soup last night. It's the same thing as the height. When I crossbreed yellow pea plants with purebred green pea plants, I get only yellow peas in the second generation. I'm not sure I follow, Gregor. The tall and yellow traits are dominant, 
I'm calling them factors. The short and green are recessive. It's like a competition, and the tall and yellow factors usually win. The monk is not really following Mendel's logic. What seems perfectly clear as a major discovery to Mendel is lost on his fellow monks. But that's not all he's discovered. Mendel has learned that even when the dominant traits win out, those other traits don't disappear entirely. They go into hiding. When he breeds these tall and yellow plants from the second generation, most of the time they have tall offspring with yellow peas. But there are always a few short plants or green peed ones. In other words, plants that have the recessive traits. Mendel loved statistics, so he begins counting. One, two, three. For every one, three dominant two, plants, three, one recessive one, one appears. Two, a three to three, one ratio. One. The existence of dominant and recessive traits is one of Mendel's two big discoveries. The other was the independence of each of the seven traits he studied. A plant could have one dominant trait, like being tall, yet have a recessive trait like green peas, or vice versa. It could be recessive short and have a dominant yellow pea. These traits seem to be passed down independently of one another. Mendel called these inheritable units factors, or elements. Today, we call them genes. And each one of the seven pea plant traits he studied had a separate gene controlling it. Genes control characteristics, and parents resemble their children because they inherit genes from them. And some traits are far more common than others because the genes for those traits dominate. Mendel's discovery was nothing short of revolutionary. His fellow monks don't understand the significance of what he's discovered. So Mendel decides to go public with his findings. By this point, he's fairly certain that his work is important, maybe even a little overconfident about it. He declares, My scientific labors have brought me a great deal of satisfaction, and I am convinced that before long the entire world will praise the results of these labors. In 1865, he gives two talks to the Natural Science Society in Brno. The audience in attendance for his talks are polite, but quiet. Too quiet. When Mendel is done speaking, no one asks a single question, which is unusual. Maybe they're lost in all the math and statistics. The talks have a write-up in the local newspaper, but it's far from the explosive announcement that Mendel imagined. The talks are published a year later as experiments on plant hybrids, but for the most part, they're ignored. Then, in 1868, Disaster strikes, at least for a science-obsessed monk like Mendel. The monastery elects him abbot. There are some perks to the new job. He is able to smoke cigars and play chess more, two of his favorite pastimes. But he has no free time to spend with his pea plants. He doesn't even get to tend to his beloved garden much anymore. A visitor remembered him taking a stroll at the monastery a few years after he became abbot. Mendel pointed out the flowers and bloom and the ripe pears, both of which delighted him. But when the visitor asked Mendel about his experiments on plants, Mendel changed the subject, as if embarrassed. Things go from bad to worse when he starts to get into trouble with the Austrian government. For the first time ever, monasteries like Mendel's were being asked to pay tax. Mendel is outraged. He refuses to pay the full amount and starts writing angry letters to government ministers on the finer matters of ecclesiastic taxation. Things get so heated at one point that the government sends a lawman to the monastery to seize the unpaid taxes. Abbot Mendel, open up! Mendel steps out and closes the door behind him. What do you want? You know what I've come for, old man. If you want to come in, you will have to take the key from my pocket. The lawman goes away empty-handed. Mendel is triumphant. But the other monks are embarrassed. When Mendel dies in 1884, his successors at the monastery are so eager to show the government that they're putting Mendel and the past behind them that they burn his notes on a big bonfire. Most of Mendel's scientific work, years of original observations, are destroyed. His scientific legacy gone up in smoke. 
American Innovations is brought to you in part by Wix.com. If you're an innovator with a great idea, Wix can help you realize it. They've developed artificial design intelligence that will help you create a stunning website tailored exactly to your needs. And now you can create your website right from your phone, which means you can open up your own online store, portfolio, or blog wherever you are, even while listening to this podcast. Just go to Wix.com, decide what you need a website for, pick your style, add your images, and just like that, your website is ready. You look amazing on every device, desktop and mobile, and it takes less than five minutes. Plus, you can do it with one hand. Great innovators can change the world, but first, the world has to know about you. So it's time to get started. Go to Wix.com, that's W-I-X.com, and create your very own beautiful professional website today. Across Europe, in his alchemist lair under the castle, Friedrich Miescher believes he has made an important new discovery, nuclein. So he goes to show it to the chief scientists at the Institute. Miescher's boss is named Felix Hope Saylor. Miescher emerges from his kitchen lab and heads down the hall. Hope Saylor's lab is inside the castle's royal laundry. Friedrich, sit down. Hope Saylor is sitting behind his desk. He's a stern-looking man with a thick, downward-drooping mustache and round spectacles. Miescher shyly begins to explain his discoveries. Well, sir, uh, as you know, I've been collecting pus from the bandages at the hospital. I've isolated the white blood cells by using a range of different processes. And at first I wasn't able to do that, but eventually I figured out how to remove all the... The chief scientist is immediately skeptical. And the more Miescher tells him, the more the frown on his boss's face deepens. I found oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, but I also found phosphorus. So, it's just a protein. But sir, no known protein contains phosphorus. So you found that proteins in pus do contain phosphorus. Uh, Respectfully, sir... I think it's more than that. How can you be sure that your method didn't contaminate the results? Misha can't believe what he's hearing. Hope Saylor is suggesting that he's made a mistake, and not just a small one, a major scientific error. It seems incredibly unfair. But I've repeated the experiment many times over. I I really think I'm ready to publish. It's not just your reputation that's at stake here. Maybe I'll come down to your lab and see what you have in a few days, and we can talk more about publishing. Instead of encouraging Miescher to publish his discoveries, Hope Saylor repeats the experiments on the bandages himself, delaying publication for a year. It seems he doesn't trust Miescher's work, a major blow to the young scientist's already low self-esteem. When Hope Saylor finally lets Miescher publish his results, he does it with a backhanded compliment. Miescher's study has advanced our understanding of the composition of pus. In other words, he doesn't see what wider relevance nuclein has to how cells work. In 1871, Miescher leaves Germany for a job in Basel, Switzerland. But he quickly realizes he's made a big mistake. For a start, his new institute refuses to give him space for a real lab. Instead, he's given a corner in a common room, and he has to carry out chemical reactions in the hallway. If he breaks a piece of glassware, he has to raid his wife's china cabinet for dishes. The new job also requires him to teach, which Miescher really hates. He's still happiest in his lab, or hallway, where he can conduct his experiments. Despite the lack of interest from his boss at the Institute, Miescher remains convinced that he had really found something new. There's no military hospital nearby, so he has to find a new source of nuclein. By chance, he finds one in plentiful supply. Salmon. In the 1800s, the River Rhine was filled with hundreds of thousands of Atlantic salmon. Picture a two-foot-long, silvery tan fish with large black spots down its back. Miescher can practically just dangle a fishing line out his office window and catch some, which means he can get his hands on masses and masses of salmon sperm. 
Now, the process was a little tricky. During spawning season, a male salmon's testes swell in size, producing far more sperm than most other animals do. Miescher dissects the testes out and squeezes them through cheesecloth, with the sperm running out like water through holes in a basket. In this way, he can collect billions of sperm cells. For his purposes, it's even better than blood-soaked bandages. Miescher suddenly has more than enough nuclein to work with. The only problem is sperm deteriorate quickly outside the body, especially if they get warm. Miescher has to figure out a way to keep the sperm cool, and in the 1860s, there's no such thing as a refrigerator. So he does it the old-fashioned way. He props open all the windows in the hallway. The Swiss winter wind blows in, keeping the sperm cool. It works, but these conditions will cost Miescher later in life. Still, he keeps working like a man driven by demons, showing up at 5 a.m. and working past sunset in the bitter cold. But like Mendel, no one seems to care about Miescher's work. Other scientists mostly ignore his papers on nuclein, and those that bother to read them disagree with his findings. Some even say that he's misinterpreted his own results or been fooled by contamination. Pretty embarrassing accusations for an experimental scientist. Over the next decade, a few scientists will warm up a little to nuclein, especially cell biologists who are studying something called chromosomes. Chromosomes have recently been discovered inside the cell nucleus, and some biologists believe that they might play a role in heredity. They also discover that chromosomes are mostly made of nuclein. So perhaps nuclein plays a role in heredity too. It was an interesting idea, but one that Miescher himself rejected. He thought that nuclein was probably a way for cells to store phosphorus, an important component in bones and teeth, or perhaps a trigger for fertilization, kicking off the growth and division of egg cells. His research had run its course, and he gives up and moves on. He turns his attention to writing reports on nutrition in Swiss schools and prisons. He doesn't quite give up on studying salmon, though, which means more long hours in his freezing lab. And it's those harsh conditions that are his undoing. His thick brown beard turns gray. He catches tuberculosis, then pneumonia. He's crushed when his doctor orders him to give up lab research. He spends some time in sanitariums to recover, but it's too little, too late. When Friedrich Miescher dies in August 1895, just two weeks after his 51st birthday, a few obituaries appear, but they barely mention his work with Nuclein. His work on what we now agree is the essential ingredient for life would go unacknowledged for years. The lives of Friedrich Miescher and Gregor Mendel ran almost exactly parallel. They lived and worked just 400 miles apart in Central Europe. They made their great discoveries within a few years of each other in the 1860s, discoveries that would someday revolutionize biology. Neither one knew of the other's existence, and they both died in obscurity. How did this happen? For a start, it was their personalities and personal circumstances. Miescher was shy and awkward, hard of hearing, and terrible at communicating his ideas. Mendel was a monk burdened with the running of a monastery. Neither lived in a scientific center like Paris or London, where their ideas might have gained traction, and neither had a powerful patron backing him. Miescher's nuclein wouldn't get another look for years, and Mendel's pea plant research would sit on shelves, gathering dust for several decades. But then, a curious British doctor Searching for an explanation for his patient's black urine will take Mendel's study off the shelf and in doing so, change the course of medicine forever. That's in our next episode. At the beginning of this episode, we introduced you to Ryan Eberhard. He sat down with Leah Sutherland, a producer on this show. My name is Ryan Eberhard. I'm the SVP and head of product at ZipRecruiter. Hey, Leah. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm great. Did you have a favorite science class in school? My favorite class in university was actually Introduction to Physics. It was taught by a, a legendary physics professor who wrote our textbook. His name was Hugh Young, and he opened every lecture with a Shakespeare quote. 
And he was just this incredibly dynamic man with an infectious love for the study of physics. Do you think it was his energy and his love for it that made you enjoy it? I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. It's often thought falsely that the study of mathematics and science is passionless and, and rote, but actually some of the most passionate people I've met have been from the sciences. There is a nice kind of like artistry and philosophy behind science and mathematics that I think gets looked over a lot. There is. There is. That's why musicians so often love mathematics. Actually, in future episodes of American Innovations, we turn genetic and mathematical concepts into music. So listen up for that. You can learn more right now on how a ZipRecruiter is changing the game. Their technology learns from your feedback to better understand what kind of candidate you're looking for. It's so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And now our listeners can try it for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. One more time, ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. I hope you enjoyed our first episode of American Innovations. If you did, please do give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, and every major listening app, as well as at Wondery.com. Love the info you heard? The author of this series, Sam Keen, has several wonderful books about DNA, neuroscience, and more. His book on DNA is called The Violinist's Thumb, and it's available wherever books or ebooks are sold. You can learn more about his books on his website, samkeen.com, or you can follow the links in the show notes. And a quick note about those historical recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but these scenes are based on real historical research. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. And thank you. American Innovations is hosted by me, Stephen Johnson. For more information on my books on innovation, like How We Got to Now and Wonderland, you can visit my website at stephenberlinjohnson.com. Sound design on this episode is by Bay Area Sound. This episode is written by Sam Keen. The producer is George Lavender, executive produced by Marshall Louie for Wondering.